you. Okay, so move on to item six then, approved list of contractors, maintenance and contracts, council of Mines. Thank you, Chair. I, I think the report is self-explanatory and a brief one. Um, it's obviously uh, to uh, rec we're recommending here that the operations manager for maintenance and contracts um, puts together um, a, a list of author an authorised list um, from which tenders will be invited. Um, this is in accordance with standing orders um, contained within the constitution. I would just draw attention to the fact that contractors um, these days, in view of a previous decision that we've made, and generally across the council, is that um, the uh, the uh, living wage should apply to contractors as well as to ourselves and also in fact having regard to paragraph 8.3 there and the other aspects about that whereas contractors who have used unlawful blacklists of workers in the past um, will not be um, included on such lists And so I propose that we accept the recommendation of 13.1. Thank you. Mr. Rockford, do you want to add anything at the stage? Um, no, thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Chenchi? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll make a comment first before I ask a question. Um, I did ask whether you had any questions. Yes. Chen -Chi. No, I will ask a question because um, I'm worried about a couple of things. Um, 1.8.3. Um, I actually at the council opposed the blacklisting of any companies that carried out blacklists for various reasons because one, it can't be police, so we're relying on them to be honest on their form and if they're unscrupulous, they'll probably lie anyway. So that's a question. Um, how can we police that if there is a way? Um, two, they may not be the same people that were there before, did any of the blacklisting, it could be five, ten years ago. So it's a bit like buying a house and then finding out it's got bad credit when there are different people in the house. So how do we police that? Um, and three, what's my third one? I have got a third one. Um, it's part of the question. Yes, the large companies who have a, a specific department that deals with putting in tenders and all the bureaucracy that goes behind being on improvements. They have a dedicated department. So the larger companies tend to be able to carry this out, whereas the smaller local firms don't have that time or that dedicated resource, and I think they miss out. So there's a question there about how can we make sure that we are going to be using local firms um, and that they don't get caught up in this lot of red tape and bureaucracy that tends to put them off. And, and I know that because people have told me that themselves. So there's quite a few there. I don't know whether you want them no. one at a time or whether the portfolio wants to... Answer that. Mr. Yeah. I'll let Mr. Oxborough answer the specifics if he wishes. It seems to me this is an argument or a, a discussion we've had previously. But anyway, Mr. Oxborough, if you wish. Um, all I'm saying is obviously we promote the use of small companies, especially around the town and locally. And um, part of the approved list is it's helpful to them because they can go through the process once. And then once they're approved, then obviously they're on our approved list. Um, so in some respects by helping those companies through that process once. Um, it, it saves them a lot of time rather than doing individual tenders, having to pre-qualify time and time again. So there is actually an advantage to them to, to do it in this way, which actually saves them time and cuts down yeah, on the bureaucracy. Councillor Chenchi, this is your first meeting. Yeah. Uh, let's just get a few this ground rules. This isn't an indication Let's get a few <laughs> ground rules. We speak through the chair. Sorry, chair. I apologise. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Oxborough. So, yes, yeah, so just to conclude that point, is we obviously do promote the use of local companies, um, and obviously we feel that this process is a way of actually assisting them to avoid some of that bureaucracy rather than qualifying for every single tender list. May I come back on that? Mr. Hudson. Um, really, I'd just like to reiterate what Mr. Oxborough said. Um, I think there's two potential issues here that might be of interest to the executive. One is um, setting up approved list does mean that contractors who are approved on that list only have to go through the vetting process once. And then you know, when the actual contracts come up for letting, it's a matter of them pricing that particular contract rather than producing their health and safety, etc. etc. again. 
So it's a much simpler process and does reduce the bureaucracy. In addition to that, um, probably heard me talk about Suffolk sourcing many times, um, but we do, with the other authorities in Suffolk, um, help small businesses, particularly in the Ipswich area, you know, uh, being in Ipswich Borough Council, of course, um, to register on the Suffolk sourcing system. And um, once they are actually registered on that, it's much, first it's much easier for them to actually tender the contracts. But secondly, they are also notified direct by email of any contracts in the area which they express an interest. So I hope that helps. Um, sorry, the point I was making about the large companies is that if they're large enough, they, well, they could actually use um, builders, electrician, plumbers that are outside of Ipswich and bring them in. Um, so the question there is, you know, why do we sometimes have non-local people? And I think it's because the larger companies can afford to put those uh, uh, tenders through. And that's my concern. And I don't feel that's been answered, but that's fine. I think Mr Hudson has outlined that we do actually do quite a bit through Suffolk sourcing to ensure that local companies are able to uh, to access uh, contracts that the, that the firm is placing, and equally, once they've gone through this stage and they're on the approved contract list, then the bureaucracy for those firms has been reduced significantly. So, I mean, what this does is it, it is actually it does actually make it easier for small firms to do work for the borough. On the other aspect uh, of blacklisting, uh, I think as Councillor Bowles has indicated, we did discuss this. So it was debated at council. Uh, our view was that the illegal blacklisting that has been operated by some construction firms in particular, where they have ruined the lives of people, is absolutely disgraceful. We should not have those people working for this council. You expressed a, uh, a contrary view, um, but I think that discussion has been had. That is now in council, uh, co uh, stand contract standing orders, um, as is uh, that the uh, contractors have to pay the living wage as well. Um, so that has to be adhered to for all new contracts. Councillor Cook. Yeah, I just wanted to come in with my major on, on this point about policing it. But we don't see that there's a problem here. I mean, surely but the point is that, is that there's the vetting up front, as Mr Hudson has outlined, and then any um, company that is then found guilty in a court of law of operating an illegal blacklist would be taken off the list. It's surely as simple as that. And I, I don't see the parallel at all with a household and bad credit because, I mean, a household is not a legal entity, is it? A company is a legal entity. But if the company is guilty of operating an illegal blacklist, then they should be taken off the list. I, I, I don't see the difficulty there at all, Chair. Councillor Morris, do you wish to sum up? No, I don't think so, Chair. Thank Move you. The recommendation. Okay, all those agreed with the recommendation of 31, please show. Those opposed? Move on to item 7, uh, agreed vote to reach the Council's Museum Collection, Council Rugby. Thank you. Um, the Museum's Collection um, has um, lots of items and we are pleased to be able to, oh, excuse me, uh, to, be able to, to loan those out to, to various um, people. As you can see here, they're actually <coughs> quite local loans. One is to a church in a village in Suffolk and the other is to the County Biological Records Centre. But obviously at various times they have been more significant loans. Um, and what we have wanted, what we're seeking to do is to streamline the process for loans that are actually quite short loans where the item will be in the tender loving care of the museum's curatorial staff. They're all perfectly safe and looked after. Um, and we want to sort of try and facilitate a, a quicker process for that. So whilst we're looking at these specific loans, you'll see at the uh, appendix one, I think it's called, there is a, <coughs> there's a, a it looks like a 12-step program, and as, as I have explained to some colleagues, that doesn't mean that you have to wait for each step to take place. Some of those processes can take place at the same time, so hopefully that will be quicker. Um, and we are, we're delighted, really, that we've got things that that other people want to see and that we're able to loan them to the community because obviously you know religious and some of the records office. So um, this is um, whilst asking for your permission here to do this, we're also looking at 
fact that we want to streamline the process for much shorter loan periods where um, it, 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 it isn't really feasible to wait for the executive committee, for example, at short notice to, to lend something. Um, I, hope, I hope that the paper is clear in, in explaining that and explaining some of the, the history of background to the loan section. <coughs> In the past, to various um, august uh, uh, institutions, and those perhaps less well known. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions in the report? Councillor Chen. Just a quick one. Uh, yeah, we, we like this. We agree with this. We just like to know what's being done to broaden the relationships, perhaps with other museums, and to pay the appreciated opportunities. We work all the time in the museum. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, we work all the time to do that. One, perhaps the best example recently is the fact that we've got the Milton North Dish um, by doing a reciprocal arrangement with the British Museum, who are keen to loan out to partners. They have a remit to do that. Um, we are receiving next year in February the Constable painting that um, has been purchased. It's coming to us, which is we have done some work. And curatorial advice was given on that, so we are having that painting coming as a painting of Salisbury Cathedral, and it's coming up with the so there's another example of some work that we're doing with another museum. Obviously we work with colleagues in Colchester with whom we, we have a partner arrangement, but we are always looking for opportunities to work outside. And to make sure with appropriate with appropriate um, uh, um, care that objects are lent, because they're obviously they're precious and we need to make sure that they're safe. And we also need to make sure that we're not sending things away for such a long time that, that they that it would disadvantage the people of Ipswich by not having them. Australia. Uh, I, I really mean a whisk as in a kitchen whisk of some sort. Um, very interesting. Uh, but <laughs> who did it belong to? It belonged to somebody uh, allegedly. I believe, Chair, that there was uh, some relationship between the suppliers and Captain Cook. How, how appropriate is that? So they yeah. Whether anybody could actually prove that or not is another matter. That's our turn this <laughs> Uh, are there any further questions? Can we agree recommendations? Three. Thank you. Move on to item eight, outcomes of housing development service review. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I can refer you to the recommendations under paragraph 13, because they're all listed individually, the points um, which have arisen from the review, which is all part of the transformation programme. I'm assuming that you have all read of those um, items all in, in there. I won't unless any specifically ask or want me to go through all of those. Can I just pick out a couple of those that I would specifically mention? Um, in 13.5, it refers there that an options appraisal to, is to be undertaken to consider increasing the occupational therapy resource in Ipswich. This is to be done in consideration with the County Council and the NHS um, people. This is all to do with disabled facilities grants and uh, that's uh, why I wanted to explain that. And the other one I wanted to mention are 13.6 and 13.7 combined really, which refers to the private rented sector where we are trying to um, put some emphasis on. In fact, only today we had um, a, a, the launch of a, a private tenants um, lettings agency um, arrangement that we agreed, a partnership in fact, um, and that was that's sort of the start of a lot of consideration we hope and a lot of improvements as to how we might work with the private sector as we do have to deal with um, private um, rental accommodation obviously at a time when we haven't got as much social housing as we would like. But as I say, I, I've just picked out those two, all of those items um, have considerable merit. Um, most of them, you will see, will are subject to further consideration and will be brought forward um, to the Executive Indian Court. Any questions? No. Can we agree recommendations? Yeah. Thank you. Move on to item nine then, uh, Economic Development Service <coughs> Review. Uh, it's Councillor Jones, of course. <coughs> The Department of Related Transport in Council Smart's name, I'll deal with that, but Council Jones, if you wish to uh, confirm. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, as, as with the uh, previous paper, this is part of the transformation program, and there's been a review of the um, of the development department, which um, comprises those areas listed under 1.4 uh, um, policy context. Next section, and then a summary of the key findings which feed into the recommendations uh, at the end. Um, again, they're quite a lot of detail, but so I will um, simply pick out um, a couple. Uh, one, 4.1 in investment, and 4.7 is linked to um, research and intelligence, where um, we recognise uh, general acceptance across the council that um, when we're making decisions on bids, on projects, <coughs> they're interested in getting funding for, they need to be supported by a really sound evidence base uh, if we're to be successful. And as the peer review that uh, we had fairly recently highlighted, this is an area where we um, could improve uh, our performance and we, that need to accumulate a more detailed and resilient body of evidence will help us we will be successful in our bits of projects uh, across the council corporately in the future. So um, that's one. S secondly, uh, 4.8 Ipswich Market. Um, it, it seems quite a small figure, but I think um, the plan, the target to increase income by 15,000 a year is um, quite an ambitious one. Um, we run the council and uh, I, I think we work very hard with traders. We have a very good market supervisor that the traders are pleased with, they're pleased with the support we've provided, our investment, better um, publicity, uh, and so on. We've expanded the number of stores into Princess Street and Charles Circus area, and you know, we'll, we'll continue doing um, all of that. So hopefully that will be a little success story um, in a year's time. And I think the last one I'll mention, uh, Chair, is the Tourist Information Center. Uh, the region's going to be closed four weeks for work, <coughs> Mr. King will mention that later in the papers. And while that's happening, we're going to um, pilot a service where um, people will go to the Tourist Information Centre if they're going to buy tickets um, for the region elsewhere, in fact, face to face. Currently, there's a very small percentage of uh, region's tickets sold face to face, 10% in total. So this will be a useful pilot, and hopefully if it works well, then it will allow us to save money uh, in, in the future. And I'll, I'll stop there and uh, allow you to move on to parking and future. Thank you. Just draw attention to uh, paragraph 411, Integrated Transport, following the transfer of the Highways Agency uh, to Suffolk County Council, uh, the uh, the highways department of uh, Ipswich Borough Council consists of one officer, uh, and uh, although my, Mr. Newsham uh, does a fine job, uh, we do need <coughs> some some more support, in particular around some of the more strategic issues that are that are going to be uh, that are going to be coming up. Parking services, uh, the um, the promotions that we've undertaken, so park for pound and Quids Inn have significantly increased usage in the various car parks and we'll be looking to see what else we can do to increase patronage and uh, we have set uh, an income target appropriately. And civil parking enforcement, uh, it is good news that uh, we're looking at an, ext an extension on that contract. Uh, it's, uh, although, uh, Although traffic wardens uh, are not particularly uh, looked favourably on by, uh, by the drivers of cars, 
uh, we do know that for residents who, uh, who are plugged, sometimes plagued by, by traffic uh, problems, um, they sometimes wish that we had more of them. Uh, we will be looking to see whether there is a business case uh, to see whether if we can expand the number of parking enforcement officers that that could be self-sustaining. Uh, but we will only do that um, if that is the case. <coughs> do we, do you wish to add anything at this point? Thank you. Are there any questions, comments, Councillor Ruffin? I just wanted to go back to that point at four point nine about the Regent box office to clarify that the box office one once it reopens after the work that we will discuss in a bit, I mean, there will still be a box office when, when it's open for shows, because obviously there will be people who will report tickets um, at them on the day, and I mean, certainly um, I have gone to um, shows and theatres and picked up tickets for subsequent um, performances, so, so there will be a box office um, when it's open um, in the evening or indeed for matinees, you know, whenever it's open for shows, just to clarify that point there. I think I think the longer term aim that's stated here about a, a single a, a shared box office with partners is, is really the most interesting and exciting point because I think that's the best way that we're going to maximise the kinds of things that people will go to if they can buy them all in one place. I know I would prefer that. Obviously lots of people do things on the net but actually it is still the sort of thing if you enter to a box office you might see something else in another venue advertised and you go along. So I think actually that's the that's the exciting thing that we need to work towards in a, in a good accessible location that works for all that works for all those parties. So I'll Anybody else? Councillor Chen Chen? Chen. Uh, discussing the rest of the questions. Um, how big is the deficit on the civil do you want one at a time or one go? How many do you want? Four. Let's do one at a time. Okay. How big is the deficit on the civil parking enforcement budget? Yes, Uh, I don't have the exact figures with me, but it is diminishing, and we aim to, by the, the end of the contract, which is October 2015, the current calculations are, projections are, that it will be a zero deficit at the end of the contract. Uh, it came down, I think, around £70,000 last financial year. Perhaps that figure could be No. So, okay. Councillor Chen, you'll be aware that there, is, there are two issues around this. It's, it's the old debt versus deficit issue. There were significant start-up costs uh, when, when the CPU was brought in. The idea was that the account would make sufficient revenue to pay off that debt. Yeah. That's what the issue has been up until now. Uh, but we are, making, so we are making sufficient to make inroads into that, um, and in particular with the extension of the uh, contract. We're reasonably confident that that would have, that would have been money. Same question. Um, why has the bid been called from joint approach of inward investment? And that one under um, oh, sorry. Under item one, uh, we used to have we inherited in fact the jointly funded inward investment officer post. Now that post is gone and we're reconsidering the best way forward because we've not employed uh, another and nor do I necessarily think that we're likely to with this extension in the future. Yeah, essentially, I mean, the, the previous post holder left, um, and after, after a review by both sides, by the Borough Council and, and the bid, I think it was decided that that post hadn't necessarily delivered all that had been expected of it or necessarily value for money. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the areas to which the Labour Group would attach priority in attractive, attractive in water investment? I'm oh, sorry, I will get used to doing that again. Chair, is, there, is this massively appropriate for this paper? We're looking at, for example, an innovation centre for ICT um, at the town centre. We have a, a smart Ipswich um, project that we're investigating, which um, Mr. Lee can give you details of. We're looking at uh, UCS Advanced Manufacturing Technology uh, project that may come off. We put money aside in our capital uh, fund 
for the museum HLF bid because that obviously has, if we win that, it has repercussions. Uh, the benefits that will come you know, to the town are not so simply cultural but economic uh, also. We put money aside again in the capital funds for the Cornhill Regeneration Project. Again, that, that makes us and the town centre a more attractive option in all uh, kinds of uh, ways. And um, we're looking at ways of improving um, our tourism offer, at least for part of the year, on the waterfront because um, there seems to be the view that it's something we probably do need to do a bit of research into that people uh, approach the town via the waterfront. So the ways in which you know we can sell the rest of the town to people arriving there, uh, it might be worth us investing in that. I mean, that's a few things, Chair. But I don't, you know, one does. I think that may be worth uh, Councillor Chetty speaking to the Secretary uh, the Economic Development Team who is working on this. There is, uh, I think, a difference of uh, emphasis between the, between the Borough Council and the County Council on human investment. Uh, the County Council uh, has a view, in, in my view, uh, slightly unrealistic, that we're going to get massive companies investing from the brick uh, economies. Uh, you know, you know, Brazil is doing great at the moment, but I'm not sure how many people from Brazil are wanting to invest in uh, in, in Switch or indeed Suffolk. Uh, what the work that Mr. Hendron is undertaking is looking at existing companies in uh, in Switch and Suffolk and seeing where we might get them to invest further into the town. Uh, and we have the report later on on the agenda around Burgess, for instance, where that's a very positive. Um, uh, bit of work there by uh, getting the new, uh, the new offices in Princess Street, uh, work which enables them to expand. We've got a successful firm which we hope will be, will be bigger. The news that Willis are going to be taking on another 400 jobs as well. Uh, so that is the emphasis that we will be undertaking, which is to get work with the successful companies uh, and to get them to try and grow within uh, Ipswich and Suffolk. Chair, we'll just add uh, one more thing, which is we're developing with it essential uh, uh, Ipswich Prospectus, uh, which is about you know attracting businesses to the town and will be available online. And it, that, alongside, uh, is a way which is a kind of quick, um, it's a very fast access to why firms should move in Ipswich, why you want your employees to live in Ipswich, and why you might want to relocate or set up the or grow. So I think that will be, you know, it's one of the things which will be helpful. I don't know why. That's changing. No, that's fine. Third question. Yeah, the other question. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Wish to ask Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, can we read recommendations at 11? <coughs> Move on to item 10, uh, financial outturn uh, report. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. We brief on this one. It's a report purely for noting, obviously, as it says in the, the very top of the introduction, financial standards require that uh, we take this report into practical after the end of the financial year. If it were not for the unusually late election this year, we probably wouldn't have it before now. Um, key points to highlight, um, first of all, in section five, the service group outturn um, noted in paragraph 5.4, which was just about two thirds to a million. Um, so a, a worthwhile underspend, certainly, and that will assist our financial position. But I think also noteworthy that it's a, a much smaller underspend than we've had in recent years. I think that's an indication of, of the increased pressure council's finances are under as the government continues its austerity program. Um, section 6, the, the housing revenue account outturn, um, fairly healthy as it says in paragraph 6.3, uh, working balances for the year closed up at uh, 4.6 million as opposed to uh, a, a minimum approved working balance of 1 million. I think further to that as well, in section 8 on treasury management, there's, there's a couple of paragraphs in there on the Icelandic situation, and that's highlighting the, the position whereby we received back a significant amount of money from the Bank 
the remainder will be written off by agreement with uh, PwC, our auditors, um, and Lands Bank, where we were successful in auctioning off, together with uh, dozens of other local authorities, our um, investment there, which has effectively closed off the, uh, the uncertainty and uh, brought us to a position of certainty and a slight um, surplus on our worst fears in the Icelandic situation. Um, I think that's all I really wanted to say, Chair, but uh, there may be questions, I guess. Mr. Hudson, do you want to stage? Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Chenchi? Thank you. Uh, just one. Close to my heart, community and cultural services. Uh, much more the overspend of 162,000. Yeah, back to him. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'd like to draw your attention to page 70, um, which actually does give a detailed breakdown of the underspend on community and cultural services. So, you've got that. I need to do this one. As you can see, the uh, underspend has arisen during the year. Sorry, books. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> you want to point us to the page and the line that's causing you? Yeah, 5.5 the table. Um, community cultural service minus, well, I presume that's an overspend, West 162. Yeah, I think it's Yeah, I think it's Yeah, I mean, Chair, I think it's as Mr. Hudson says, I mean, they're, they're, sorry, I'm 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 sor
the intention at the time of the original executive report was the pay, uh, the loan would be paid back uh, to let. This is a loan rather than a grant. Um, that would be paid back out of the community infrastructure levy uh, as that was introduced and uh, more development was undertaken. Uh, however, two things have changed since the original uh, agreement that executive made. One is that having had discussions with the Environment Agency, uh, they had a different profile for, uh, for the funding that they needed. It was um, uh, slightly back, uh, not quite as <coughs> loaded as they originally discussed. And also there, are, uh, there were concerns about the amount uh, of community infrastructure levy that we will, uh, the prediction predicted to receive, in particular given uh, the work that's been done on the Northern Fringe, where we're not expecting uh, any community infrastructure levy uh, because of the significant section 106 agreements or infrastructure that are required there. Uh, so we did. We have returned to uh, to the uh, to the lab <coughs> and agreed, managed to agree with them, renegotiate the repayment terms, significant uh, extension in the repayment terms, which is obviously good news uh, for the council and will enable the uh, the flood, completed flood, flood defence scheme to go ahead. Uh, councils will have been circulated. Um, with uh, another document, hopefully one got paper copies, but now it's been emailed, uh, which is just around further consideration, entire further consideration of funding issues. What this does set out is that even with the uh, this existing repayment schedule, there is a significant amount of risk around uh, this project. Um, we should be going into this with our eyes open. It's still, we still don't know exactly how much income we're going to get back uh, from SIL. Uh, however, this is such an important project for Ipswich, but I think we should, we should still go ahead with it uh, from the renegotiation, from the negotiations that we've had with LED. Uh, I, I believe that should we uh, find that we're not getting sufficient SIL in, income back in future, there will be an opportunity to renegotiate um, and uh, uh, they will be open to us doing so. Uh, but the most important thing is to ensure that we have the we managed to come up with this uh, 6.6 million pound shortfall in the flood defence scheme because the whole thing could fall if we don't uh, if we don't bridge that gap. Mr. Williams, do you wish to add anything to the stage? Just one thing, if I may. Uh, the thing to emphasise <coughs> realistically is that the scheme is still dependent on this money. Uh, and that the Environment Agency wishing our bit of it, if I can call it that, later in the process isn't impacting on the overall delivery timetable of the scheme. So uh, they are at an advanced stage of the procurement or the barrier component itself and hoping to let that contract reasonably uh, soon. So it's, uh, it's been led by their new timetable, their funding profile, not by when they can deliver the scheme. Uh, cancer elsewhere has covered the, the other part in terms of the payback. <coughs> Any questions? Well, yeah, only really to point out, Chair, I mean, as has been mentioned, you know, this work is already underway and that's highlighted in, in paragraph 2.1 where it says that of the total scheme cost of 50 million, 18 million has already been spent. So rather difficult to sort of turn the tide back there on this one. And, uh, and uh, you know, put the plug on it. So, but, uh, um, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's 10 million from the borough council and 40 million from others. So I mean, I think it's, it's clear that we have to go ahead with this. I think the uh, of the options that are evaluated from others put forward, they clearly the, uh, the only way to go. Thank you. Green recommendation at 14. Okay. Then move on to item 12, uh, creation of fundraising trust. Thank you. As you can see, we're being asked at uh, Thursday to come up with a new fund for the five to do three things. So one is to set up a, uh, a trust for fundraising. If you, if you read the body of the paper, um, the, the advice and the knowledge that we have um, is that the best way to collect the money, to gather money together, will be to be in a trust. It will enable us to take 
advantage, uh, the best financial advantage of any monies that we get, and it will also, um, some donors are more likely to give a trust and frankly to give to the council, any council, sorry, I shouldn't have said this, not this council, any council, which is important. Um, we need to recruit and appoint trustees to that, and we also necessarily need to create a campaign board and to recruit campaign patrons um, for the High Street Campus project. We've got a lot of money to raise, but we are um, optimistic, we're keen, and we're ambitious about that, and I think it's important that we, that we get this going, and there are the, the, these three steps on the way to, to achieving that. Um, and we have already um, recruited um, fundraisers, and we have an, an excellent project manager with lots of experience of raising monies like this. Um, and so we have every, every confidence in it, and this is, this is just part of the building. Any questions? Thank you, Chair. Yes, we're very supportive of anything that adds to the tourist offer. Um, how will the work that will be monitored and how to count? There's a project board for there's a project board which is separate to this, which is the project board for the um, for the, the project which involves talking, there's another paper here which talks about how um, people design galleries and the architects and things like that. That comes through this executive committee where we, uh, we need to make decisions on that and look at that. Uh, I would also suggest to you that the culture working group will be taking a look at what is going on and how it might usefully contribute to the, to the overview and the scrutiny process of that. Um, and, and ultimately we will go to the full council, but the board itself will they will be, will be set up with the government structure because it's very much on the uh, with the government structure that reports directly to this executive. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can we read recommendations at 13? Thank you. Move on to item 13, uh, High Street Campus Project Gallery Design Services. Okay. Gallery Design Services are an important part of that. They kind of go with the architect. Uh, it's important that we that we do this sooner rather than later because actually that will inform our vision, the vision that we will present to the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, in November. We need to we need to be absolutely clear about what we're going to do um, uh, before they will before they will give us any money, frankly. Um, and so what we need to do is work earlier rather than later with gallery design services. Obviously there is a, a limited amount of work that's done and it's subject to contract and it's getting rated the money, but it, um, it's quite common that we should work at this early stage with uh, with people who are experts in this in this field. Um, I think anybody who's visited any galleries, um, which I have done, museums, can see that the quality and the, the effect actually of really, really professional, high quality gallery design and this is really important to make sure that the whole the whole place works really. Is C, which is the supplier chosen, um, absolutely the right tie, or was it solely down to budget? And that leads on to what are the appropriate termination provisions referred to in the report? Um, take the first question. Yes, the uh, we had a full and very robust uh, interview process. Um, carried out by members of the design team and members of the council and Sims as well being involved. Um, we took a full view and we used the meat most economically advantage tender whereby we used a percentage scoring as well, not just on best on price. Um, the designers are very good designers we have appointed. We've used them what well, Sims have worked with them before. Um, I was looking at some work and they've worked on some major projects across the country so they're a, a very good design. And the other one was the termination. termination. Yeah. Um, it will be a standard clause within our contracts, as with all our contracts, for, for a form of appointment for designers. There is a termination clause in there. Uh, if you want more information, I can get that to you. Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank no. you very much. Uh, also, uh, just to remind Councillor Chen as well that obviously we try to put as much in the open agenda as we can. 
uh, there is more detail in the confidential agenda uh, which give you an indication of the questions that were asked and the waiting that was put on uh, as well. So uh, you can be sure that it's not necessarily down to the cost uh, of this file to be chosen. <coughs> can we agree the recommendations? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, and then item 14, Region Theatre, Heating and Cooling Project. Thank you. Yes, um, this was the item we spoke to earlier. Obviously, um, the heating at uh, this time of year is more the cooling than the heating, I should think, in any venue that anybody that would want to visit. Um, but it, I think it's important that we improve the experience for all visitors to the Region Theatre. So, this is a, a, a valuable piece of work. As you can see, that the, um, this contract was um, left under. Um, uh, the delegated authority because it was uh, in March during the pre-election period. Um, uh, <coughs> it would be an opportunity to to do other works within the region as well. I think, I think we can put it the signage outside, for example. Um, it's important this work is carried out. Again, it gives the opportunity to deliver the box office in a different setting and to and to gauge really what the effect of having having the box office somewhere else uh, is, frankly. Customers, so we really, really want to hear back from people as to how they, as to how they um, find that solution. So um, I think the detail is here. I don't be surprising, he says this report's been, been, been prepared by Mr. Oxford, which I can't believe is the case. <laughs> but uh, um, do you wish to uh, to comment? Uh, Any questions? Councillor Chen, she bearing in mind this has been noting some decision. Yes, been yes. Uh, just uh, one thing in the risk management number six. According to that risk, the possibility of work going over budget isn't considered unlikely, i.e. to see. So can the portfolio hold give reassurances that lessons have been learned from the recent <coughs> project? Mm -hmm. Lessons are always learned. Are there any more questions on the report? <coughs> Can we know the decision? Uh, item 15, plan maintenance, uh, town roofing. Councillor Morris. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this report, um, as shown in the recommendation of one, is also to note the decision. Um, members of the executive at the time will remember that in March we agreed to go out to tender um, for the roofing contract on the 127 Tarrant bungalows, or prefabs, Rushmere prefabs as they're called, um, and some bungalows, 42, sorry, not bungalows, 42 garages. Um, it says in this report, Tarrant bungalows stroke garages, and I wouldn't want people to think that the garages are attached to the, to the prefabs, there are 42 garages across the borough. Um, anyway, the, the, the tenders were um, dealt with during the PERDA period. The recommendation here are, are, are after a full tendering exercise um, is that we note this report. The lowest tender was accepted. This probably was written by you as well. <laughs> do, you wish to, do you wish to add anything at this stage? Um, no, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Any questions? <coughs> Any reports? No. Can we agree to note? Thank you. Um, Item 16, exemption from contract standing orders. Councillor uh, Moles again. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is another one, another um, decision that was taken during the further period. And this is to um, note that this relates to the procurement of a, a contract, a very small contract, um, here to supply out of hours electrical call out services um, for some tenants. Are there any questions? on this item. No. Can we again note the uh, decision made? Yeah. Thank you. Um, then item 17, uh, which is update on two decisions taken by the Chief Executive uh, during the further period. Uh, the first one relates to the reletting of the uh, of the 1440A plus contract, um, councils will remember that's originally done under human <coughs> provisions 
uh, without a competitive tender, uh, but uh, that we, at, the end of, at the end of that uh, initial period, we did have a competitive tender uh, that was undertaken, uh, which is good news. We are able to uh, continue to uh, provide, have that service provided for, uh, for residents in uh, Chantry. Uh, the second item uh, relates to uh, insulation of homes. Uh, again, councillors will remember that uh, due to uh, changes that the government made to the eco scheme, um, that uh, a large number of homes which we were going to insulate uh, suddenly fell out of that scheme. Uh, my reflection was in about 300, 400 councillors. We, we completed in the scheme 150 out of about 380. <coughs> now we're, we're so uh, um, we noted at the time of that report uh, that uh, as the uh, the government's uh, green funding is in uh, a certain amount of chaos, that there may well be uh, opportunities that can came up at short notice, and indeed that did prove to be the case during the, the Perder period where, uh, where some Green Deal funding uh, were, came up which we had to apply for in short order. Uh, it was right that we did apply for that. The options uh, are listed in report about where that money was uh, best spent and the decision was made uh, to, uh, to invest that money on the Greenwich Estate, uh, Robeck Road and Hogarth Square where uh, in particular there were properties who had been, uh, had been told that their houses were going to be insulated um, and then fell foul of the changes that the government introduced. So uh, those, those tenants who had been told that their properties were going to be upgraded uh, now will be able to have their homes upgraded. Uh, those are the two decisions that were made by the Chief Executive. I don't know if you wish, wish to add anything to those. Only that if you've got any questions on Appendix 2, a colleague to my right is more likely to answer than me. Are there any questions? Uh, Councillor Mollins, as sorry, Councillor Mollins. Yeah, just very briefly, Chair. I mean, obviously it was disastrous news when we heard that the government was letting the energy companies out of their commitments to, uh, to invest in insulation works and so forth. Um, this is you know, some antidote to that, but not a complete fix, of course, and the number of properties concerned is significantly fewer, as, as Councillor Bowles has said, but clearly good news for the, uh, the households concerned. You know, we know from feedback from households that have this work done, and they save literally hundreds of pounds on their energy bills as a result of the work, which is obviously good for the households, good for the British economy as well, so they've got more work, more, more money rather in their pocket. Uh, more disposable income, so um, good news. Let's hope that a few more opportunities like this come along. Yeah. Obviously, lots of good news for the energy companies, which is probably why they persuaded the government to drop the skid. But let's just be considered. Council models. Thank you, Joe. I won't repeat um, the, the stuff that Council Cook has just made, um, but just on the numbers. Um, we, it was 384 that we had agreed some two and a half years ago. We completed 152. This will provide another 45, which will mean that we're still 187 um, properties um, that we are hoping that something will <coughs> come forward where we can take advantage of this. But just on the point that, that, that you mentioned yourself, um, that these are being done on the Greenwich Estate, um, that, that is sensible in the sense that not only were some of the um, tenants lined up and informed that they were likely, uh, well, I think they were told that they were going to get this done because that's where what we understood to be the case. Um, apart from that, some of the houses in, in, for instance, Robeck Road have been done and some haven't, and that, that never bodes well with tenants who have been told they're going to get it and then they're not. So very much welcome this, but as Council Court said, we need to look out for some more. Any questions? No? No. The uh, decision to take one sheet, that's it. Thank you. Then move on to item 18, uh, sale of land on Princess Street. Uh, the uh, council has been in discussion with uh, with Burkitt's LP, uh, significant local employer, 
of high value jobs uh, to uh, try and secure new premises for them. Um, they have uh, their, their preferred site is the uh, the site of the uh, of the of Riley's, uh, with the RC the sort of RCP car park as well. Uh, the council does own the free of that, which does uh, bring a uh, a, a small, uh, ground rent to the council for this development to go ahead. Uh, the, uh, the lease and the free hold do need to be uh, do need to be joined together, uh, so that there is this offer to uh, buy out the free hold of the council. Uh, it's a, a a small but uh, not insignificant uh, capital receipt, uh, but I think that aspect of it uh, is much smaller compared to the wider implications of this. Uh, this will be the first new office development in Ipswich since the building that we're sitting in now, uh, which I think we all remember was quite some time ago. Um, so uh, that, that is good news that the office market uh, in, uh, in Ipswich is sufficiently robust to enable something of that nature to go ahead. I think it is also something uh, many of us um, have looked at the Princess Street corridor, uh, giving its links to the uh, to the rail station. We see that this is uh, a great opportunity, uh, probably the best opportunity for office redevelopment in the uh, in the town centre. But, uh, if we can enable this uh, development to go ahead, to go ahead with Burkitts, uh, then uh, that there is the uh, there is the potential for further. Uh, office development in the future, and the, the borough, of course, does have an interest in other sites in Princess Street. Um, it is a great uh, vote of confidence by Burkitts in the town. Uh, the, not only the over 200 employees that they already have, which they, they will be secure in the town, uh, there will be the potential for them to expand as well, uh, and say high value jobs, um, which will be which will be good news. For the, for the local economy. Um, we have had an offer uh, by the uh, by the, the developer to buy us out uh, as, as identified in the report. Uh, there are some changes that we're suggesting, some additions to that, which we have notified they involve. In particular, uh, the two things are getting some assurance that the development will go ahead and will go ahead in a timely manner, and also uh, that it is it will actually be for uh, for Burkitts uh, rather than uh, the office development going ahead and then perhaps some lower value uh, employment employment going in there, and also just uh, some reassurance uh, that uh, uh, a revaluation un uh, is undertaken. When this uh, when this finally goes through, but with those those additions, which uh, we don't believe will be are, are controversial, um, then we uh, the proposal is that we do go <coughs> with this. Mr. Williams, do you wish to add anything? Are there any questions, Councillor Chair? <coughs> yeah. uh, yes, we welcome this. It's good news, and um, we'd just like to know why Jay would not instruct you to instruct you to value. Um, and I did notice on a forum that people were quite astonished at the, the price of 255000 So it might be worth explaining that that is good value, um, especially if it's filled with people who can see for themselves. So so that's two questions. Why would JL? Because I think that would have given a, a reassurance. Um, and just, you know, about the 255000 price. Uh, I will try and choose my words carefully because there is significantly more detail about the finances in the uh, confidential appendices uh, that I can't directly refer to in answering uh, either of those two uh, questions. Uh, JLL uh, have effectively provided an assessment of value. Uh, they just need to sign off on the precise certification component. Uh, so there is enough in uh, there for us to be confident that it is uh, you know, a technical uh, matter to be resolved rather than uh, a fundamental uh, issue. So that's the first point. Uh, the second point is uh, about is 245,000 a good price. Uh, we don't have complete ownership and control of that site, so we are not the only 
organisation that requires a financial arrangement to be reached in relation to making the site available. Uh, the leaseholder uh, is also there and again there is further detail in the uh, confidential appendices about some of the other financial arrangements associated uh, with this arrangement and uh, all this potential uh, development uh, and the assessment is that the balance between what is effectively two payments is reasonable uh, in regard to the extent of the ownership within our control and the extent of the ownership within a third party leaseholder uh, control. The other component here uh, which picks up on something that Councillor Ellesmere referred to earlier is that the office market in Ipswich is not a particular point uh, and there isn't a vast amount of profits to be made out of uh, any development. The second hand office market in Ipswich has some reasonable vacant space at comparatively low rates and well below what you would build offices for if you were starting from scratch. Uh, so part of the assessment is, is somebody else monthly making a substantial profit here which we as landowner uh, would then expect to see a return from and the basic answer to that is no because our office values are significantly less than other places around the country. So it has been looked at in some detail and there are pages and pages in Appendix 1 and Appendix 2 which I can't directly talk about. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. I'm just going to add to what Mr. Williams has said. I mean, in section 9, in particular, paragraph 9.3 and 9.4 of the open papers, you know, there are other financial dimensions to uh, this um, deal, as it says here. Um, first of all, you know, business rates, um, car parking, um, there, are, there are other financial aspects that need to be taken into account when evaluating the deal. But as you saw, there's a lot more detail in the open papers. Any further questions or comments? Any good recommendations? Okay. Thank you. Uh, and if we can then agree item 90, uh, exclusion members of the public uh, to enable us to discuss confidential items. Can we do that? Uh,